Well, it's been an interesting year. I want to thank the uh, Soybean Promotion Board. I pretty much exclusively funded my irrigation program this year because I came in late and that was the only, uh, that was the only commodity board funding I was able to go after uh, or that funded me. So I'm very appreciative of that. So I tried to hit the ground running as, as hard as I could and, uh, and get up to speed in Arkansas. I'm originally from uh, Kansas and worked in Nebraska for 13 years. So I had a lot of help. I kind of inherited a legacy project on irrigation uh, that Leo Espinoza and Paul Francis had been working on, and, and we've all partnered and worked together to, uh, to try some different things and, and really, really get at some of the issues with irrigation scheduling. Um, so I want to recognize them. There's, there's quite a group. I've got a graduate student working on some pump monitoring uh, data, and uh, Ismanoff and Sarah Hirsch just came on in May to help me as a program associate. And then I'm also working with the irrigation district on, uh, on a couple projects. So, <clears throat> has anybody can so so just a little bit of trivia? What uh, what would be the four states or the top state in the the gallons of irrigation water pumped in the United States in terms of acre feet? What would be number one? Anybody have a guess? It's California is number one. Who is number two? Texas, no. Anybody? Arkansas. Arkansas is number two. Texas is number three, and Nebraska is number four. In just the gallons of irrigation water we pump. Now, I, I find that really interesting and amazing because of, if you look at the land mass size, we're the smallest state by far of those four in, in land mass area. So we pump a lot of water in Arkansas. <clears throat> so if we look at water use in Arkansas, agriculture using about 90% of the consumptive water use in Arkansas. And this is important because the state is in the process of updating their water plan. And you will probably be hearing about this over the course of the next two years. There's a consulting firm out of Colorado, CDM Smith, who is who's doing that for the, the, the Natural Resource Commission. And so if you hear about public meetings, if you hear about uh, things in the press, I would, I would go to those meetings and, and be, become informed about the state water plan because agriculture has the biggest uh, stake in this, in this game. So just, uh, just wanted to bring that awareness to you. Uh, the other thing, if you've not heard this already, that we, we basically pump out of two aquifers in Arkansas. Uh, the alluvial aquifer, most of our irrigation water comes from the alluvial. It's only about 42.4% sustainable out of our withdrawals. The same is true of the, the Sparta Memphis. It's just not used as extensively. Um, again, one rule of thumb I kind of like to use is we need to reuse our water use, groundwater use by half to become sustainable in Arkansas. So I think we can do that through irrigation scheduling and conservation and also through, through improving irrigation systems, um, things like tailwater recovery and, and uh, surge valves and, 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 and poly pipe, proper planning of irrigation systems. And I think we can get there. And you may kind of see that through the presentation, how I think we can get there. So, so some of the current work that I'm doing, uh, we're doing some work on... Uh, or Paul Francis has done some work on maturity group, not finding a difference between maturity groups as far as how to schedule irrigation. Uh, we've done some plot deficit studies, uh, working with farmers on, and, and trying some different irrigation scheduling techniques. I'm going to cover that today. Uh, and then a lot of on-farm demonstration through the, through the verification program and also through the Discovery Farms program. And then I'm also doing some work on, on irrigation pumping plants, performance, and energy use. And I'm probably not going to be able to cover that today. So <clears throat> basic irrigation 101, just to cover some basics, this is basically how we schedule irrigation, the soil water balance equation. So essentially what we try to do is we try to fill the profile up so we have a full profile, and we try to match evapotranspiration, which is the water that leaves from the surface and through the plants through transpiration with precipitation and irrigation. And, and this changes to the growing season, which makes our job harder as, as we schedule irrigation. Small plants don't use as much water as when they, when they get to the reproductive stage. And it's an important concept. 
we don't always, uh, we got to keep in mind. So things change us on this, as we go through the season. Um, basically, if you think about the, uh, the soil water profile, it's like a bank. Um, when you fill the profile up, you can overfill it. That's actually called saturation. Um, that's when there's more water than the soil can hold, the gavimetric waters, more than the gavimetric water. And, uh, and when that leaves, like after it rains, that's field capacity or after irrigate, we try to get to field capacity. That's kind of a critical threshold for us. And then we have what's called the managed allowable deficit or zone, depletion zone, there's lots of terms for it. We basically want, uh, if we go too far, we get clear to the wilting point. We want a safety factor there. So we try to, to try to operate in this management zone. And, and colleagues all over the country and I, we try to figure out how big that MAD should be and where that refill threshold should be for us in our state and our soils. And uh, that's, that's a lot of the function of what I'm trying to do in the next couple of years. This uh, refill point has actually been established and been the same since 1986 when we, we were, you know, they first started developing the Arkansas irrigation schedule and we've stuck with that. And I think we can extend that and I think I'll show you here why I think we can extend that a little bit. But that could allow us to irrigate a little less often and could save some water. Another important concept I'm going to talk about is, in, uh, is soil matrix potential or, or pressure. And it's well represented, I'll talk about it in terms of cinnabars, and it's opposite of moisture content. You think about moisture content, the, the higher it is, the more water there is in the profile. But with soil water potential, it's exactly opposite. So it's kind of like a plant trying to extract water out of the soil with a straw. When the, when the soil is full of water, you can put a straw to the soil and pull water out real easy. And as it dries down, it gets harder to pull water out of the soil. And that takes more pressure. So when it gets to the wilting point, the plant is like trying to suck a golf ball through a garden hose. That's one way of kind of thinking about it. So a really high number in cinnabars is really dry. And a, a low number is wet. So just kind of keep that concept in the back of your mind. And that kind of shows that. So <clears throat> what are the tools that we have to schedule irrigation in Arkansas? The Arkansas irrigation schedule has been around for since 1986, and it's been updated a couple times. It's a software program, it's still available. Uh, you download it and download temperatures off of uh, the National Weather Service, uh, basically is where that comes from, and then you can run it on your computer. And, and, uh, and <clears throat> I'm in the process of updating this. Uh, we've, we've started making a web version. Phil Tacker and Earl have started doing this, and I've been working on this for the last six months to make this a web-based scheduler. And so all the temperature data is already gonna be on the website. Uh, you just go in and put in your fields. It's going to operate the, the same as it has in the past, and it'll run on your phone. It's a web-based uh, application, but the idea is you can go out in the field with your smartphone or your iPad, and you can enter in your scheduling information. The temperature is all taken care of. You don't have to mess with that, and, uh, and that'll be a tool that I expect to have out soon. We'll, we'll probably give it to educators and agents uh, and other um, people we work with closely to test it this next year but I hope to have it available for everyone next year. Assuming the programmer doesn't have any glitches. Um, there are other tools out there. There's the uh, Mississippi Irrigation Scheduling Tool. It's actually not out, uh, but they'll have something like this in the next year or so. And then Tennessee has a tool out there, and that, those are the tools in the region. Miss Missouri has some, some other tools as well. Uh, <clears throat> So I've been focused a lot on using other things in a schedule. I don't really like uh, schedulers. You know, you have to go back to the how or back to the office and use a computer and put everything in, and it's kind of cumbersome. And I think a lot of people don't really believe them. So I like to have things I can see and feel and touch and make decisions about. So I have started to evaluate several different types of sensors, and uh, and. Um, other, other methods, and, and these are kind of, there's a lot of things out there you can use. There's all kinds of sensors, um, soil matrix potential sensors, um, tensiometers, gypsum blocks have been around for a while. There's all kinds of volumetric sensors, di uh, dielectric and capacitance sensors available on the market you can pick up and use. Uh, they all need to kind of be calibrated to your condition and your field or your soil type. Uh, and then there's a canopy temperature, if you've heard about smart field, actually an uh, infrared camera that measures canopy temperature to tell you when to irrigate. Those are being used and sold. 
And then there's uh, meteorological based tools. Uh, you can buy a thousand dollar weather station that gives you ET on your farm, on your site, and you can, and you can schedule off of that. And then there's also the atmometer, which is a really low cost, basically, way of estimating ET. And there are others I've not listed. I'm going to focus, so this last year, I focused pretty heavily on the, soil, on the watermark sensors and the atmometer because I think those are the two uh, most likely tools people might adopt. The watermark sensors have been around. They're the, probably the lowest cost and most widely used sensor uh, in the United States and probably arguably in the world. Uh, they cost about $35. And uh, um, very inexpensive, easy to read and use and interpret. And, uh, and that monitor, too, is, is a $200 instrument you can, you can buy and use it to schedule irrigation. So if you use both of them together, it gives you a little bit more information. So, and that's kind of what I would suggest. But, uh, and that's what we did. But these are the watermarks. You can get all kinds of different combinations. Anything from a basic manual read, a sensor that costs $35, you can read it manually with a $200 reader. Uh, you can buy, you probably want about four to six sensors in a field, uh, but the manual reader you can use uh, uh, across your, you know, across all of your farms. If you want to track things, you can put a data logger, they cost about four to $500, and put it in your field, leave it there all season, then you can just go read it when you want to. Some of these will graph for you, so you can track and see the change, and that's the real value of these sensors. Uh, and then some of the ones I've been using are the, um, other wireless sensors, and so on our plots where we're trying to make decisions about when to irrigate based on thresholds, I can go there, we can see uh, what the sensor out in the field is doing, and, and if I fill the profile while I'm irrigating, and that's kind of a valuable tool then to see what's going on and everything comes to one point. They do have some limited range right now, and, and the industry is working to extend that. But a lot of this stuff is, is still evolving. So here's a, here's a plot. Here's some of the plot work we did in Stuttgart on some soybeans. We, I did a split plot design where we looked at ripped and, and non-ripped uh, treatments and tried three different to soil moisture thresholds to see if we could see an effect 30, 40, 50 percent uh, threshold, thresholds, soil moisture deficit thresholds, and, and remember I talked about the MAD, I'm trying to figure out where that maybe should be. And basically what you do, so this was all scheduled with watermark sensors, and we put them at 6, 18, and 30 inches. Now in Stuttgart I have a, a tillage pan at 18 inches, so that sensor at 18 inches is just right at the tillage pan, and then I have a clay pan down at 30 inches in this, in this soil, it's a DeWitt silt loam. And so that's the, the really deep subsoil profile. If you're really just scheduling, you'd probably just use the upper two sensors, but I wanted to see what's going on down deep. <clears throat> so this is what it looks like. They're fairly easy to install. Anybody can install these sensors. My, my six-year-old can put them in, actually. If you, if you pick the right time, uh, you know, the ground's not really hard. They go in real easy. Uh, use a, a, a piece of pipe, or a, here I use the soil probe. But if it gets dry, you need a a little bigger guy to help you do it. So, um, but the six and 18 inches, you could do six and 12 or six and 18, nine and 18, somewhere in there. The idea is you want the sensors in the root zone of the plant and represent what the plant is seeing for soil moisture. That's the idea. <clears throat> so I looked at ripping and the reason I ripped was to, to uh, evaluate uh, this till, if I broke up this tillage pan, what would happen? Now this is ripping. But what we, what we did was no-till ripping, so low disturbance ripping. The idea is if you look up in the corner, that, that shank comes out, it's really narrow, and then, and then it's got a wide blade at the bottom. The idea is that it's destroying that tillage pan and trying to open that up. So I want to open that profile up, see if I can get air and water in there, because I just noticed it was hard to get these sensors in the ground when I first, when I first showed up. So was there an effect from this? And that's why we did this split plot. And this is some of the data that you'll see uh, when you plot the watermark sensor. So this is a 30% moisture deficit and 50% moisture deficit. So we triggered irrigation at a, at a lower threshold here than I did here. Uh, and in the, in the, uh, the black is rain and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and the blue is irrigation. So you can see what goes on in your soil profile and, and what kind of job you're doing as you irrigate. And this is the 30-inch profile. We pretty much saw this in every sensor I put across the state. Uh, right about when we get to uh, the vegetative st or the reproductive stage, here's R2, uh, we're, we're mining that subsoil profile in, in the reproductive stage, and I saw that time and time again. 
Um, you can see if you, how deep you irrigated, you know, we get the, the zero, six inches, we get that profile full. Not always at the 18 inch profile would we get that full. And as the plant gets bigger, you take the average of the two then to decide whether to trigger irrigation. That's what we did here. So that's kind of the information you get. Uh, we had one time where we had a three inch rain and then a, or irrigated and then we had a big rainstorm right after it and we just and we didn't even get the 30, we, no water got down to that 30 inches. So, and that really surprised me. I really thought we'd see some, some moisture migration. We didn't. So we actually saw, we did see it on some other plots or some other fields, but on this particular one we didn't. So uh, what is interesting about this, it, it actually rained too much for me to do irrigation research. Uh, is that we kept getting little bits of rain in, in uh, August and early September. I never got to the point where I needed to irrigate. We only irrigated these plots twice, um, basically once in the vegetative and once in the early reproductive stage. So, so really, we didn't learn as much as I'd like to about that threshold because I never really got to where I wanted to be before I, I needed to trigger. But that's the neat thing about the sensors is that if you're trying to make a decision, it's rained here and there, off and on, you don't know exactly where you're at, or you, you know, it's time to, should I irrigate or not? The sensors do provide you some information about should I be irrigating or can I wait a little bit longer? It might rain again. You know, I'm okay. Let's just wait and see rather than just go ahead and irrigate because the scheduler says it's time to irrigate. <clears throat> so this is, this is the yields that we saw from the, um, from the plots. We averaged about 50 bushel an acre with no fertility program because I didn't get there in time to put it in. Uh, the rip plots were about seven bushel better than the, the non-rip plots, and I didn't see any difference in the, in the moisture deficit treatments, which is not really that surprising given the, the weather pattern that we saw. And next year, I expect to widen that more. We're going to actually try to create stress and uh, see if we can get a yield, a yield response. Uh, dry land would have been about 20, 28 bushel and uh, there's no difference down the plot. These are about half acre plots. They're about 1,000, 1,200 feet long by eight rows. I don't do small plot research, so these are fairly big, big plots. Uh, we actually measured height. We saw a difference in height between the ripped and non-ripped. It was significant. Again, not between the moisture, the moisture treatments. And then we dug some holes to see what the roots looked like, and I think these are pretty self-explanatory. If you just look at the roots, if you were a soybean plant, which, which side of the field would you want it to be planted in? You know, there's just more roots in this, this ripped treatment than there is in the non-ripped treatment. So if you ever have any, you know, if this is valuable to you, you know, I think that we have this tillage pan in Stuttgart on the station and we need to, you know, if we want to improve, improve crop health, I think it may be a factor. So how much water do we use to irrigate? Um, we used between, we only irrigated twice, we used between seven and, and 10 inches. We had a lot of runoff. You know, I liken it to trying to irrigate concrete uh, in, in the soils here, which is surprising to me coming from the Midwest. Uh, and I'm irrigating more because I'm, I'm irrigating until that sensor goes to zero. So I know that I filled the profile because I'm trying to track the deficit real closely. And uh, so I'm irrigating in these plots, you were between two and five inches to get that profile full. A lot of runoff before that sensor, before that bed completely hydrates across. Now that is a quite a bit less than, than farmers or everybody else is irrigating like around two, two to two and a half inches. May or may not be getting that profile full. And this is an issue. Um, but, but I did use, we did use a little less water, but again, we got some rain in September. So I would, you know, if I was following the schedule, I would have gone ahead and irrigated but because I never really got to my threshold, I just, we just didn't irrigate after that, so. <coughs> Excuse me. So the other tool that, that I've started using and I really like and seems to work well is the, uh, is the atmometer or the ET gauge. And uh, you know, these are a, a really simple instrument. Basically, it measures or approximates crop ET. Uh, it's got a canvas cover and a ceramic cup on top and that mimics the evaporation from the leaf surface. And you fill it with distilled water and it's got a, a sight gauge on it in uh, zero to 12 inches and, and you set your deficit. And you basically fill it up when, uh, and you'll have these two red marks and, you'll, uh, and that'll be your deficit. And so after you irrigate or the profile's full is where you set the top mark and then you set your deficit 
And when, the, when, the, when, the, when, when you have enough ET to get your deficit, then that's your trigger for irrigation. And that's basically how that works. It's cost about $200. Um, we used the, the alfalfa referenced uh, at Mometer this year, and that seemed to work good. Uh, so that's basically, you know, how you do it. If you have rain, you slide it down because you've added, you've added, it's like adding water. Um, um, so if you get a half inch of rain, it all goes in, you just slide the lower ring down half inch, it's like adding water to the atmometer. And then that's your new trigger. And, and so you can see every day, you can go by and see where you're at, when you're going to have to probably irrigate. And it gives you a way of assessing um, the soil water balance in the, in the soil profile. So it's kind of like the, if, the, if the soil water bank is, is a bank, you know, this is kind of like being able to call in and, and balance your checkbook because this is your checkbook right here. You can see it every day. You don't have to write anything down. You can just move the marks when you need to irrigate and you don't have to write anything down. That's what I, that's what I really like about it. Now, the other thing that we've done with this, we've got some charts that you use because to really use it, to use this correctly, what you have to do is uh, it's specific to soil type and then you have to stage your, your crop. So the deficit changes with the stage of growth. So when the, remember when I talked about the plant small, didn't use as much water, your deficit is bigger. When you get to the reproductive stage or peak ET, uh, maximum evapotranspiration, full canopy cover, uh, that number decreases. So, that, so then you can adjust your atmometer thresh, or deficit for that. And this is just the one sheet piece of paper. Uh, and then terminate out of our 6.5 is our current recommendation for irrigation termination on soybeans. So this is all also in a smartphone app that Darmender Saraswat has put together and we're testing that this next year. So the idea is that you can do this all in the field, all on your phone, without, any, without writing anything down. You can, you can schedule irrigation with an atmometer on a field. <clears throat> and uh, so one of the things we've done is we've, we've put this on top of the, we took the atmometer on top of ir scheduling with the irrigation scheduler to see if they matched up. And, and this is what I'm trying to show here in this graph. These are the ETs from the atmometer. And, the, and, the scan, and when we irrigated uh, on some plots, and, and they pretty much, except for a few places, line up. Where they don't line up quite as light, well as I'd like is at the very beginning and end, but we're generally not irrigating at the, at the end. We're done at R8, and, and, the, and the trigger point would just be a little more conservative at the beginning. So I'm pretty comfortable saying that that monitor is going to give you the same answer that the scheduler, the Arkansas Irrigation Scheduler, is going to give you. So. And if you look at ET, uh, the temperature-based ET that the scheduler uses versus the alfalfa reference atmometer, pretty much get, it's within an inch by the end of the season. So, so they basically are both going to give you the same answer, very close to it. Another tool that uh, Paul Francis has been working on is the Arkansas tub gauge. And this is, uh, this is what it looks like. It's um, derived from the Georgia Easy Pan. Uh, this has been around for a while, but this is a pretty low cost, probably like $25 or $30 instrument you can make yourself. It does what the atmometer does, maybe not quite as precise, but it, same thing as it gives you a way of assessing your soil water. This is an irrigation threshold, and, and when it rains, it actually fills itself up automatically. It's kind of nice from that respect, but uh, you know, we're trying to develop simple tools so you kind of know where you're at with your water balance. And so you can make good decisions about when to trigger irrigation. Uh, <clears throat> this is some of the maturity group information on full season sharky clays down in Aurora. Uh, and, and Paul compared the, the tub gauge with the ET gauge and the scheduler and the tensiometer. I didn't find any significant difference between those four methods. They're all giving us the same answer. He did this on a... He did this on a double crop system. Again, it's not significantly different. It scales off a little bit there, but they're giving us the same answer as the, the tensiometers are actually watermarks. So, so we're getting some comfort with, you're gonna get the same answer really no matter what method you use. Uh, this is from one of the discovery farms that uh, <clears throat> we, we have several installations on discovery farms where we split it into two halves and we're, we're doing the scheduler and then that monitor to see if we get the same answer and, and we're pretty much getting the same result with those as well. Um, this particular field, I, I threw this slide in here because they ran out of water 
at August 1st. So we irrigated it twice, and then we didn't have any water when we got to the reproductive stage. And uh, so right at R2, um, we started getting uh, um, dry. We ran out of water. We irrigated uh, in, 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 in June and July, and then we ran out of water. He doesn't have a well. He's all surface water. He's in the big cone of depression. And you can see that, you know, we got really dry. Uh, and I lost my sensor because they hit it with the, uh, the sprayer when they were spraying for stink bugs. Um, so I lost some data for a little bit. Um, but, you know, it can really help explain what's going on. Now, if I had to go back and do it again, I think the producer and I would really like to have maybe saved that first irrigation. Because if we could have slid these irrigations over, we might, not, we might have reduced this peak and we might have picked up, you know, some, you know, reduced that yield loss quite a bit. So, you know, this is, again, just kind of a way of, of explaining what's going on in the soil profile and tracking it and, and then understanding what maybe happened or things that we can do better. So this is some of the information we're able to derive from these installations. Uh, <clears throat> so this is from uh, the same, the same uh, farmer, a little different uh, uh, part of the, uh, one of the sensors. Here we irrigated, we brought the profile to zero, we, we had a rain, we didn't get it all the way to zero, we went way high, we almost got it to zero when we irrigated, and then you can just track and see basically what happened. And, and one of the things we've learned is that the that is telling us to irrigate at about 30 to 60 centibars. This one was 30 to 40, 50 to 60 lines up with the current recommendation. I really think we can extend that a little bit to probably 80 or 90 centibars, and that could probably reduce this. Some, I mean, we wouldn't have to irrigate quite as often then, so we keep the profile full. He did that all on four inches of water. So his yield was 46 bushels of the acre, which isn't too bad. Again, at the station, I had about 27 bushels of the acre on dry land. So it gives you some frame of reference. <clears throat> so just lessons learned. Watermarks, I think, are a useful tool. They will drive you a little crazy if you just base all of your information on them because they do have change and, and they're spatially, you know, they're, you know, they're just at that one little point in the, in the field, and so they don't rep, may not represent the whole field, uh, but it does give you some information about what's going on in the soil profile. So if, you're, if, you're wait, if it looks like it might rain in a day or two, you might be able to delay irrigation because you've got some comfort with the, uh, with the, uh, the watermark. So on one of the discovery farms, we were an inch past deficit. So we were an inch past on that monitor where I wanted to irrigate, and... Uh, and they couldn't get the water on it because they didn't have it. And uh, or there was a delay in getting it. They were too busy to do it. And uh, we were still on the watermarks. We were still okay. So, so there's, having both of those pieces of information really gives you some comfort about, well, should I irrigate or can I wait a little bit longer? And, and the more times you can wait a little bit longer, the fewer irrigations you'll have through the season. So... Uh, we still need some additional information on where this threshold is, and that's, that's really what I'm going to be trying to do over the next couple of years, so is figure out how far can we extend it if we can't extend it, and really update the scheduler. And, and uh, The original schedule is actually done on, with tensiometers, and the, uh, they, they're really limited to about 60 centibars. After that, they get really quirky and hard to use. They'll break suction and stuff, and I really think that uh, that's why we have this magic limit of about 60 centibars in our recommendations and the scheduler just lines right up with it uh, on the plots that we've looked at, on the fields that we've looked at. So if we can extend that a little bit, I think we can save water. So, uh, And this is, uh, I just want to thank you for your time. This is uh, irrigation research is a little bit expensive because uh, instrumentation is expensive, fittings are expensive, flow meters are expensive. And uh, this is the, uh, when I lost it, this thing had our dollar atmometer that uh, didn't quite make, couldn't compete with the, the John Deere spray boom when he sprayed for stink bugs. So uh, the other thing I want to mention real briefly too is that uh, we've been measuring water on the verif all the verification fields and farms. I've got about 35 flow meters. I need more flow meters to measure water. But we're really trying to get a better handle on water use in, in, in row crop agriculture in uh, in Arkansas, and all the coordinators have been real helpful uh, with me 
patient with me to get these meters out and use them and, and understand how to use them better and, and get good quality water use data. Because as we start to update the water plan, we need to have a really good handle, I think, on how much water we're really using on our, in our, in our, in our, with our recommendations in Arkansas. So with that, I'll, I'm finished if there are any questions.